So I'm here to present on a three-year project co-funded by the Bonneville Power Administration. Um, and we just finished the first year. Uh, it's work done by a number of people at University of Washington, Oregon State University, and UCLA. Um, it worked? Yeah. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so the Columbia River Basin uh, is located in the Pacific Northwestern United States. Um, our domain is defined as the USGS Huck uh, 17, um, and then in addition, the Canadian portion of the Columbia River Basin and the Pacific drainages to the west in the United States. The basin drainage area in total is about 670,000 square kilometers and making it the fourth largest in North America. It has a Mediterranean climate um, and a very uh, complex topography. So you have the, the Cascade Range to the west, the Rocky Mountains to the east, and then the dry Columbia Basin in the center. So snow accumulates in the mountains in the winter and then melts into the spring and summer, making for a very strong signal in the seasonal hydrograph. Um, accordingly, the river is intensely managed for, uh, for hydropower, irrigation, flood control, um, ecosystem management, in particular salmonids. Um, Climate change studies are by no means new in this domain. In particular, in 2010, Hamlet et al. conducted a study uh, looking using CMIP-3 uh, GCM output. So one of the goals for our project is to update and enhance that study uh, using the latest output from CMIP-5. But in addition, we're trying to get at uh, assessing the uncertainty in hydrologic projections due to methodological choices. So hydrologic model, downscaling method, global climate model, what effect does the choices you make in that, those scientific choices, what effect does, do those have on, uh, on the uncertainty in your projections overall? So our study is going to run from 1950 to 2100, uh, and we're going to be employing three hydrologic models, uh, with forcings downscaled using two different methods with 10 global climate models and two representative concentration pathways. So in total, that makes for 120 future hydrologic scenarios. So it's a, a very big data crunching project. Um, the three hydrologic models we're running, first is the variable infiltration capacity model. So it's a distributed hydrologic model. Um, it's been used very effectively in climate change studies in the past. Uh, one of the ed, um, accomplishments that we've made so far in the project already is that Joe Hammond and our group has developed a glacier model implementation in VIC. So this is, I'm showing on the right, uh, all the blue grid cells are grid cells in which um, the glacier model is running. So that's about 600 grid cells throughout the 24,000 grid cell domain, and he's already seeing an increase in about 25% in stream, fall, uh, stream flow overall. So it's a pretty significant increase and a good uh, advancement to the model. Uh, we're also running the precipitation runoff modeling system and as well the unified land model, so which is a merger of, of NOAA and SAC, more or less. So the model implementation, all of the hydrologic models are implemented at a 1 16th degree resolution in an independent grid cell setup. So in, all three models are implemented in exactly the same way. The reference data set we're using is a no regulation, no irrigation flow time series provided by, by the Bonneville Power Administration and the U.S. Army Corps at 160 discrete locations throughout the basin. So we have time series at each of these different locations. Now typically, when you were to go about calibrating your hydrologic models, you would take those time series at each of those locations and calibrate all of the upstream area uniformly. You would um, you would uh, perhaps multiply each of your different hydrologic parameters um, by a certain value, but the point is that you would treat the entire upstream area in the same way. But we know that that's not the case. Um, it ignores uh, heterogeneity within the subbasin, which is a particular concern in the Columbia Basin given the complex topography. 
So what we're doing, uh, it, would be, it would be great if we had a reference data set that were at the same resolution as, as which we were modeling. Um, fortunately, we can create that data set. <laughs> So what we do is we're implementing this inverse streamflow routing technique developed by Ming Pan in which we distribute the, time, the streamflow time series. So we take the streamflow at each of these different locations and so each of those, there's a daily flow, uh, a daily flow at each of those locations which represents the aggregated flow from the upstream area. And, but we also know at each of those, for that upstream area, how long it takes for, every, for a runoff from every grid cell to get to that outlet. So we essentially, using that information, the daily flow and the travel times, we deconvolve the stream flow into a single hydro, uh, a daily time flow series for every single pixel within our calibration domain. So what we end up having is time, stream flow time series at every single grid cell in a 1 16th degree resolution. Here's a little example. Uh, this is in the Pondere River Basin, which is in the northeastern part of the Columbia River Basin. And these are just two, uh, three sample, sample spatial fields of runoff. Um, you can see in the two on the, on the left, uh, you can, the onset of spring melt, and then on the right, uh, just a sample period in, in October 1998, very dry. And here it is for the, uh, the entire domain upstream of the Dalles, uh, which is the red dot. And so given these 20,000 streamflow time series that we have, all of a sudden we're afforded the ability to calibrate at the exact same resolution as which we model. Um, this leads to two very nice benefits. One is purely mechanical in that we've built a very strong infrastructure um, capable of handling each of these calibrations in a uniform way. We, we run it through the shuffled complex evolution method using um, calibrating between six and eight parameters depending on the model and um, uh, using the Klingupta efficiency at a weekly time step as the objective function. And, but we've built this infrastructure that's able to, to handle each grid cell independently, which is, is very good in terms of reproducibility. But number two in terms of the benefits of this method is that we're able to hopefully get more at the sub-basin heterogeneity of parameters. Typically if you're calibrating by sub-basin, you end up getting cliffs in these parameters uh, when you go from sub-basin to sub-basin. And those cliffs and parameters extend into cliffs into uh, hydrometeorological fluxes. Um, oh. I, can I go back? Oh, there we go. I almost stole my own thunder. Um, so anyway, we, the question remained though, despite the fact that by, the de by definition, each of the grid cell stream flow was improving with respect to the reference data set of distributed stream flow time series, um, we didn't know whether upon routing that flow back to the NRNI gauge point, whether it would actually be improved. Um, and in fact, it was. So in black, you're seeing the NRNI flow provided by BPA and the U.S. Army Corps. In red is our a priori flow. This is all PRMS simulated flows routed to that same location, the Cabinet Gorge and the Pond Array. Um, mean monthly, by the way, for the calibration period, water years 1992 to 2001. And so red is a priori and blue is calibrated. And we're seeing an improvement both in the Klingupta efficiency and in the annual bias. Uh, we are seeing a, a delay in the recession, but we're also seeing a significant improvement in the rising limb. Um, the reason that we're putting so much emphasis into calibrating these models is because they're going to be the foundation of this project moving forward. Uh, so we're going to be carrying these models forward, and we want to make sure that they're as good as we can get them. Um, the next step is to evaluate the sensitivities of these hydrologic models. So we'll be implementing the work of Veno et al. 2012, uh, essentially applying a perturbation in precipitation and temperature uh, to the observed, the historical observations, and seeing what kind of effect that has on the hydrologic models. Um, and then we'll take the known, uh, we'll 
the, the predicted uh, changes in GCMs and then and apply those to the hydrologic models to kind of get a preview of what the hydrologic models are, are going to uh, project with the, the different GCMs that we'll be running. Um, so after that, we'll be making a final section of GCMs. And this is work that's done by David Roop at OSU. And he's ranking GCMs by a variety of different metrics and their relative errors. Um, and so you can see just on the left, the bluer a GCM is, which are they're along the horizontal axis, um, the bluer a GCM is, essentially, the, the better it is. Um, and so he's doing that work for us. And he's already made a preliminary selection of 10 GCMs, but we're just trying to, um, to inform that selection with the sensitivity work. So then we'll, there'll be a downscaling and bias correction of the met forcing step, uh, followed by running those hydrologic models for the period 1950 to uh, 2100. And then there'll be a flow routing to about 300 sites and a stream flow bias correction step. So despite the fact that uh, if we might have a bias in, in our calibrated models, we will be correcting for that finally. Um, and then we'll be dissem disseminating those results for uh, use by stakeholders in the public around fall of 2016. So in summary, uh, just kind of two main, main parts. One is that the calibration of these hydrologic models to distributed runoff fields is an effective way of improving your routed stream flow. Um, and then finally is that in the future, what we'll be doing is running these hydrologic, uh, just determining the hydrologic response of the Columbia River to climate change uh, by running these 120 different uh, permutations. And I just want to stress also the, the work that's gone into developing this robust infrastructure, which does aid in reproducibility. I want to acknowledge both um, the funding sources and our collaborators, and with that, I'd be happy to take any questions. Thanks. We have time for one question. Mm-hmm. Yeah. How well would it was that work you have Yeah, so it, it Im is it improved the more gauges you have. To a certain point, you can't have gauges very close to one another. Um, so there was kind of a quality control step in there. Um, however, the more gauges, the better. So if you want to go out and get more gauges, that'd be fantastic. <laughs> Um, you inverted the flow, mm -hmm. and you had the flow from multiple gauges, and then you redistributed it specially. Mm -hmm. How did you aggregate the flow uh, from the different parts, especially as uh, in big, the, there is the same uh, unit diagram for each grid cell, but as you get the station, um, there will be different biases. So how do you aggregate all of the information and then redistribute it over the grid? Um, well, the unit hydrograph, we're assuming that all the flow leaves the grid cell with, within the first day. Is that what you're The first day? Yes. Okay. So, because we are running it at 1 16th degree, so it's a pretty, it's six kilometer resolution. Right. So, yeah. And then the flow is at what, 3.5 meters per second? You, you specify, you still specify the. Within the routing model. Yeah, but yeah. It, within the routing model. So there is, there is going to be some uncertainty in the fact mm -hmm. that, you know, there is different. Different routing yeah. parameters, exactly. mm -hmm. So, is that something that you address? So, we don't calibrate the routing model at all. Um, and we assume that is fixed, but okay. that would be a great, um, a great future investigation. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Um.